And yeah, welcome back. The Brotherhood Sisters Soul is a social justice youth development organization that actually focuses on issues such as youth leadership development, educational achievement, social justice, and so much more. The organization provides greater opportunities for youth members to have economic security, as well as healthy minds, bodies, and spirits, as well as academic success in lives that inspire others. The Brotherhood Sister Soul has been involved in campaigns to fix PS 186, as well as reforming Stop and Frisk, as well as closing Rikers past the MTA and increase the student support staff via the 2020 campaign. And so here to share a little bit more about Brotherhood Sister Soul, give us further insight, is the lead organizer and liberation program facilitator for Brotherhood Sister Soul, Marsha Jean Charles, and then also another member of Brother Sister Soul's liberation program, Maya Fortuna. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having us. Happy to talk through whatever you want to talk through. Yeah, we're glad to have you talking and uh, sharing with us. And so when we talk about your programs, you got a lot of great things that are going on. And um, for people who don't know about the Liberation Program, uh, a program that's geared towards, you know, helping people be liberated, give us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the Liberation Program is a youth organizing, youth activism program. It's youth guided um, and by way of various summer programs and different aspects of the program, we have around 30 something young people who are working to affect change in their communities. And our current campaign, you already named the 2020 campaign, um, is specifically around increasing the numbers or the budget rather for New York City public schools. So as to hire um, student support staff, including guidance counselors, coordinate or college counselors, social workers, et cetera, um, and to end the school to prison pipeline and police and culture overall in New York City public schools. Maya, you're a member of the group and uh, talk to us about your participation and what you feel the, the, the group actually brings to you. The group is like a second family to me. It's when I, I'm in an LP, I'm there to actually, it's fun and it's not, it's, I don't see it as a job or a, like a burden. It's something I enjoy to do and love to be in. And so when you talk about what you actually do, so uh, for somebody who doesn't know what you do as being a part of the group, Maya, give us a little bit about what you do. Well, as an um, LP member, I have lobbied in Albany for our 2020 campaign, participated in an exhibit for that same campaign, attended rallies, which, which I speak on to again get more visibility for our campaign and speak about the defunding the NYPD and to get more um school student support staff in our schools. Mm -hmm. So Marcia, as a young person uh being engaged in activism at an early age, um it's very key and it's very crucial. When we think of a lot of the great civil rights leaders, those who've been involved in activism before all got their start pretty much at, at, at a young age. So what does it mean for you being a, a, a youth activist and a leading youth activist uh, and helping people become so entrenched in society that needs this kind of assistance and this kind of voice, um, given the, the climate that we're in? Yeah, I think the climate that we're in is integral to our future success as a city. And I think um, it's so obvious that young people are leading a lot of the efforts to defund the NYPD or just to bring voice to issues that our communities face. Um, I am an alumna of the Liberation Program. I was a member when I was in high school and went off to college and graduate school and came back. And so for me, it's also like coming home and Maya mentioned like the family feel of brosis or the brotherhood, sister, soul. Um, and with Liberation Program in particular, I get to actualize my politics. I get to support young people in affecting change in ways that I also support um, and I also get to be a part of the legacy, the 25 year long legacy of organizing and racial justice work at the Brotherhood Sister Soul. And so I think we are wrong to believe that the youth are the future. Uh, youth are the today, they're the leaders now, they're affecting change now in a variety of ways and in the liberation program, we do it by way of consensus, by way of our campaign. Um, and at Brosis, we also do it through efforts of like campaign and also trying to amend the varied ways that young people are criminalized in New York City and by amend I mean end and abolish and mm -hmm. so uh, we're doing that in a variety of ways and the liberation program is definitely a key and integral part to that larger vision for the future of New York City. 
when you talk about some of the things that you're really uh, passionate about, I, I heard both of you talk about one of the things in your organization is defund the police. Uh, some people say it's the wrong thing to do, but for you guys, you guys have really been very vocal about defunding the police. I'll start with Maya. Um, so give us a case for why you feel the police should be defunded. I think the police should be defunded because it's they're not trained and they're just they're not trained to be in our schools and to have them have more money than our schools is just incorrect because some some schools are underfunded, which means that they're missing student support staff, which includes guidance specialists, career counselors, social workers, therapists, and college counselors, which which is really needed. I think the question, when people get nervous around defunding the police, and I remember a, another organizer, Bob Ganji, um, we had a meeting with him during our summer programming, and, and he, he offered like important insight, and it's something that I'm going to bring to this conversation. I think the question should be, do you want to fund police more than you want to fund schools? Do you mm -hmm. want to fund police more than you want to fund equitable housing? Do you want to fund police more than you want to fund food security in your community? And that's really how we look at it. We look at it as, as of right now in COVID-19, there is uh, a limited supply of resources and we have to use those resources to better our communities. And the more we fund the people terrorizing our communities, the less we can fund actual community success. The, yes, we can, the less we can fund the needs of the very people in our communities, the less we can fund the things that make our community better. And so it's not necessarily about divesting from the police to divest from the police. It's about ending police brutality, of course, and always, but it's also about investing in our communities and making our communities better. And we have to take it from somewhere. And so let's take it from the people who have never really been charged with doing so. I want to talk about another program that you guys are really dealing with. It's the MRTA program. And for people who don't know what uh, MRTA stands for, certainly it's the Marijuana Regulation and Tax, uh, and Tax Action Act. So uh, for someone who doesn't know about that, uh, talk about your work with, uh, with that program. Yeah, so the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act is actually a bill um, put forward by a number of communities. And we are working in collaboration with the Drug Policy Alliance and a, a variety of organizations um, working to legalize recreational use of marijuana for adults. Um, and the act itself is a bill that's been <laughs> on our state uh, elected floor for, for some time. And I know most recently they you know, voted to further decriminalization, but marijuana has been decriminalized in New York City since 1977, and yet people were getting arrested in large part and the recent decriminalization bill of last year didn't, it supported a lot of the things that we wanted, but it didn't actually legalize marijuana and it, therefore it didn't really decriminalize our communities. Because the reality is that it's not about the drug, it's about who's using it. And we find time and again that our people, black and brown people, black and Latinx people in particular, are getting criminalized for things that are decriminalized in other parts of the state or in other parts of the country. and we are getting targeted by over policing and and various things of that nature and by that we are getting put into prison in large numbers right and so the fact of the matter is that marijuana use um, is one of the things that our communities go to jail for and we all know that our communities are not used any more than any other and so the best way to actually secure our communities and also to bring back funding for our communities is to pass the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. Um, and I would love for people to talk about that more. So thank you for bringing that up. And thank you for those who are gonna call their senators and assembly folks in Albany and ask them to pass the MRTA because it's, it's long overdue and it's definitely something we need to do now. I'm gonna bring Maya back in as we talk a little bit more about some of the programs that you're actually dealing with and, and trying to seek legislation to. Uh, and the 2020 Act, I know the 2020 uh, campaign, you've got some demands that you've actually made. So Maya, for people who wanna know a little bit about the demands in your 2020 Act, um, talk to us about, about that and what you wanna see happen. Um, for the 2020 campaigns, our, our demands just focuses on making sure that students have that students, those student support staff and not being criminalized as students. Like one of our disciplinary demands were to remove metal detectors because as students walk into schools with metal detectors, it's more like you're criminalizing and assuming that students have something on them that they shouldn't be, although they don't, because the most 
the items that are collected in at the metal detector are just hair picks, phones, and other things that aren't really weapons that super um that would really hurt someone. Mm -hmm. And so as we talk a little bit about, you know, this particular disciplinary changes, talk about programmatic changes, um, Marsha, give me a little bit about this here, because I know one of the things that you talked about in the programmatic changes that you like to see is the incentives, uh, incentivizing and crafting programs for graduates of color uh, to become counselors and then also therapists. Why is this important? When we think about what our communities need and when we think about specifically mental health and mental health in, yeah, in communities of youth <laughs> and specifically youth of color, we know that our young people are navigating the very things that we're navigating without many of the supports that we may or may not have. And we also know that schools are places where they are for innumerable hours of the day and, and they spend a lot of time in school. And if we really want to support young people, we're going to put mental health supports in school. And so the fact too is that there's an issue of the pipeline like who's going to schools for social work who's going to school for guidance counseling and such and so the reality is that we also need more people of color to do that we need more young people to see themselves in the support staff that are there to help them succeed so that they feel comfortable sharing the very things that they're going through and seeking support with those things and so to do that effectively we not only need more students or sorry student support staff but we also need more student support staff of color and principally guidance counselors, career counselors, and therapists um, of color who are not only trained um, in the varied professional ways that they're trained, but who also understand the context in which they live and the context in which many of our young people live so as to holistically be able to support them. Mm -hmm. So Maya, for somebody who's saying, listen, why should I be involved in these issues at an early age? Um, and you guys are doing a great job in terms of really uh, a fantastic job in bringing the issues forward uh, from a young person's perspective. But talk to us about why it's important for young people to be active in these issues that are uh, really hitting our society every day. I think it's important because as Marshall we are today and not the future because we are the one experiencing how the city is being ran and how our schools are being ran. So we should have a voice in what's going on and how and how things should change because we we have stories and experiences to tell. Yeah, I, I can I I can echo Maya, but the reality mm -hmm. is that young people are paying attention. Young people are experiencing the realities that we face. Young people should always have a seat at the table, especially when deciding things that matter to their very lives and livelihoods. And so, um, our city has a number of young people. There's a, a statistic that like one in every 331 Americans is a New York City public school student. That's a lot of Americans and we have 1.1 million New York City public school students. That's a lot of New Yorkers. And so they should always be a part of the decision making um, and they should always have the power to interject where needed. And, and quite honestly, it's always needed. <laughs> like youth vision, youth insight, youth innovation are key parts of our city and parts of our lives and have always been key parts of social justice movements. So, so it's, it's more of a question of like, why not? Like, why don't you have more young people um, on your decision making bodies? And why don't you have more youth voice in the very places that you inhabit? So well, let's get connected on how now uh, people get connected to you. Uh, so if people are saying, listen, you know, this is great, you have youth activism, uh, I could be a youth leader, I could be connected to an organization that's doing some great and positive things. Uh, what do people do to get connected to a Brotherhood Sister Soul? Yeah, I think it depends on what you want to do. Um, we're always happy to support volunteers who um, want to support us, and we're always happy to find ways to work together and work collaboratively. I think the easiest thing you can do is follow us on social. Um, Brosis512 on Twitter and Instagram or Brosis, Brotherhood Sister Soul on Facebook. I think we publish so many things there and post so many things there that it's, it's easy to figure out which one you want to tap into and which one you want to engage with. Um, I think most recently, if you want to hear more about Youth Voices and Youth Vision for New York City, you can definitely go on Facebook. Um, there was a Youth Town Hall mid last week, and so you'll hear more from young people about what they want to see. But I think social media is the easiest way. And, and if you're more into email, then definitely email us at info at brotherhood-sistersoul.org. Um, and the person who responds to that will direct your email wherever it needs to go. 
All righty. Well, Marcia and Maya, we got to leave it there. But thank you so much for coming and sharing with us on the Social Justice Forum. Good to hear your voices and great, fantastic work that you're doing in terms of act, being a voice uh, for the voiceless and advocating in Albany across uh, New York State. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time and sharing with us here on the Social Justice Forum. Thank you for having us. It's been my Thank you.